experience for myself some of the challenges faced by the Yorktown's crew as they struggled to extinguish the flames. Would you like to put your hat on? Yep. And uh, we'll go up onto the unit. Okay, so this is a replica of a ship. Okay, we're now in the engine room, and this is where you're going to be doing most of your firefighting. Okay, you're going to make your entry down this vertical ladder. Okay. However, before you come down here, you're going to have to put the fire out on top. Father, you're going to be fired in today. There's going to be this engine fire here. This is all, like, warped and melted and cracked from the heat. That's not making me feel too confident about no, it. No, I mean, it shows just how hot this fire is going yeah. to get. And you're going to be the first one down here, and you're going to be providing the uh, protection for the rest of the team. It's important that you get, get it right, because the rest of the team are relying on you to get into position to protect them from the rest of the fire as they make their way down there. So it's a real team job. It is definitely a team job. OK, I'm going to do the straps up. OK, a pair of gloves. I'm lucky. I'll be using much more advanced kit than that used by the Yorktown's crew at the Coral Sea. But it's still a daunting task. I'll have the key role of spraying a wall of water to protect my teammates from the flames. We'd all been briefed in advance, so I knew to take up my position next to the door. But I still didn't really know what I was in for. Wow, that's hot! Those flames are enormous! OK, I'm going in! I knew there would be an intense fire below me in the engine room. With the metal walls heating up all around us, we'd literally be descending into an oven. The men on the Yorktown would have faced a similar challenge as they battled to save their ship. I'm just going down this ladder. I'm trying to take it slowly because this is very, very slippery because we've thrown so much water and foam down here. It's incredibly hot. I'm at the bottom of the ladder now. I'm just going to set the hose up like this in a, in, a, in a wall, a shield of water. Pressure on this hose is, is huge. You can just see these explosions, these fireballs are coming. Oh, I can almost reach out and touch them. But this shield of water that I'm putting up, this wall of water is so effective that the fireballs aren't actually getting through it, but it, it's pretty intimidating being this close to fire. The thought of doing this for real on a carrier like the Yorktown, loaded with aviation fuel and ammunition, was terrifying. I can really understand what I'm doing here now, and the rest of the team can go and get to the base to fire and put it out. Dan, how did you find that? Incredible. Was that hot? It certainly feels warm. <laughs> OK, just hang on a minute. That's it, well done. Just get your hood down. Oh. OK, you all right? Yeah. Well, you managed it. You achieved the aim. Ooh, it's pretty hot in there in that last room. Yeah? You feel pretty self-sufficient in there. If you don't put the fire out, no-one else is going to. And I guess on board a ship, that's an incredibly powerful feeling. You're on your own. You could, be, you could be 150 miles from land, you're on your own, it's your team, they've got to get down there, they've got to put that fire out. Things were no different in the Battle of the Coral Sea back in 1942. Although she had been severely damaged, the desperate work of the crew had saved the Yorktown. In the coming weeks, this would prove to be a crucial victory the Yorktown would return to haunt the Japanese. But in the meantime, she began a long, slow journey back to Pearl Harbor for repairs.
The Battle of the Coral Sea was a wake-up call for Admiral Yamamoto, Commander-in-Chief of the Imperial Japanese Navy. America's remaining carriers stood between him and mastery of the Pacific. It was time for drastic action. America's carriers had to be destroyed. They had eluded Yamamoto at Pearl Harbor. He would not let them escape again. He decided to lay a trap. He would target something so valuable to the Americans that they would send out their carriers to protect it. And the bait for his trap would be Midway. Midway is in fact two tiny islands west of Hawaii, halfway between America and Japan. It was one of the few American air bases left in the Pacific. Yamamoto's plan was complex, and it involved the greatest naval fleet the world had ever seen. The main part of the fleet was divided into three groups. Yamamoto himself would be in a group centered around three big gun battleships. To the south, another group of ships carrying thousands of soldiers who would land on Midway and take control. But here was the spearhead of the attack. A group of four aircraft carriers and their escort ships the Carrier Strike Force. The 248 aircraft of these carriers were given two critical tasks. First, they would bomb the defenses on Midway ahead of the planned landing. Then, they would stage a huge airstrike on the American carriers when they came to Midway's rescue. Leading the Carrier Strike Force would be Vice Admiral Chuchi Nagumo on his flagship, the Akagi, the carrier from which he had commanded the attack on Pearl Harbor. Nagumo was a highly professional naval officer with over 30 years service. The Japanese high command was confident that Nagumo would once more lead the Imperial Japanese Navy to victory. But his carefully laid plans underestimated Admiral Nimitz, the American commander. After Pearl Harbor, the Americans had made military intelligence a top priority, and it had paid off. The Japanese naval code had been cracked. Here, at their intelligence headquarters in Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Navy deciphered details of Yamamoto's plan to set a trap at Midway. With this information, Nimitz now planned an ambush of his own. Nimitz now had three operational carriers in Pearl Harbor. The carriers USS Enterprise and USS Hornet departed first. Then the newly repaired USS Yorktown followed on a little way behind. The three carriers headed from Hawaii for a spot codenamed Point Luck, 300 miles northeast of the American base on Midway. By the 2nd of June, they were in position and lying in wait for the Japanese ships that were approaching from the northwest. Nimitz had given his commanders a single bold objective, to ambush the approaching Japanese fleet now heading for Midway and strike a decisive blow at its carriers. But these weren't the only preparations that Nimitz was making. Out in the middle of the Pacific, the US base at Midway was buzzing with activity. Preparations were underway. Flight after flight of planes had been landing over the last few days. And now the small airfield was packed with as many planes as it could handle. These planes would be vital in the defense of the island. So would the US Marines, who would be waiting for the Japanese if they tried to land. By June the 3rd, the pilots were waiting by their planes, the Marines in their bunkers. Nimitz had